Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest version of uh, Tales, Tales from Tales, Outer Tales, Space, Tales, Space, Tales, Space, where I take an HFY story from somewhere around the internet and read it aloud for your enjoyment. All the relevant links are down below. Like, subscribe, and all that YouTube comf to help this video and channel grow. Anyways, as always, I hope that you enjoy. I would just like to thank the following tier 5 patrons and channel members for supporting the channel. Fallen Angel, Buzz Kennington, Data Magnet, and Bob the Dragon. Thank you again, and now on to the story. Story number 1. The Line That Shouldn't Be Crossed. Written by Admiral Marsupial 3. Ever since they arrived on the galactic scene, the Driss had been looking for the human's weakness in battle. It wasn't like they were perfect. They had plenty of minor weaknesses, but nothing that could be exploited. Every time they found one, the humans were already aware of it and had defenses or countermeasures in place. But ever since the humans defeated them when they attempted to annex two independent systems, they had been plotting their revenge. Then we met a new race called the Aroxans, an arachnid race that had just achieved FDL travel. The sight of three quarters of the human diplomatic team either freeze in terror or just straight up running away. The Driss knew they had found it. The humans did everything they could to become allies with them, offering trade deals that greatly favored the Aroxans, sending gifts of great value, and even offering them a system that they had recently terraformed, but not yet colonized. It was clear that the humans feared the Aroxans, despite unmatching the new race in every financial, political, and military way. Unfortunately for the Driss, the Aroxans had accepted the humans' overtures and had no intention of siding with them. Covertly, they captured a large number of Aroxans over the course of a year, then spent a decade breeding the quick-maturing captives and using control chips to force them to follow whatever orders they were given. They trained these captives to fight against the docile, friendly nature, developed advanced weapons specifically for them, and 15 years after first contact with the Aroxans, invaded the closest human settlement with a new army. It went perfectly. At first, the humans were so distracted by their instinctual fear of arachnids that Driss's Aroxan troops won 90% of the engagements in the first two weeks taking two-thirds of the terraformed planets and all but two of the hundreds of stations and colonies across the rest of the system in a rapid blitz. They even cut off diplomatic ties with the Aroxans, believing themselves betrayed by the race that put so much effort into appeasing. We knew the human's temper and thought their response to the Aroxans would be severe. That's when some of us realized that something was wrong. The humans didn't seem scared or even angry at the betrayal. They seemed hurt. As some of us dug deeper, we realized they hadn't offered the Aroxans all those bribes and tributes out of fear. They had done it out of shame. They had felt so bad for recoiling in horror when they first saw them. They had seen their revulsion as a grave insult to what was actually a perfectly nice and reasonable race, and had offered all that as an apology they hadn't avoided the Aroxan systems because they were afraid, which they still were whenever they saw them. They had done it because they were worried about inflicting further insult upon the Aroxans. When the humans found the control chip, we thought that they would be angry at how the Driss had driven a wedge between the races. And they were. We thought that they would be enraged at the thought of the Driss using control chips to force others to fight, knowing the remainder of their own dark history was something that they hated, and they were. But the fact that they had done it to such a docile and friendly race, one the humans had already felt shame about insulting at first contact, and had now furthered that shame by cutting ties with them when they were innocent. It elicited a reaction that we were completely unprepared for. They changed tactics choosing to fight at a severe disadvantage so that they can capture Aroxan troops, doing everything that they could not to kill the enemy, losing many more troops than they would have if they had just fought to kill the enemy. The initial fear that they had shown when fighting the Aroxans was gone. 
It turned out he can make a human angry enough to ignore even primal instinctual terror. But even then, they still fought within the honorable rules of engagement. It took a massive diversion of their military to achieve this victory, leaving more than one system open to invasion by the Dress. Once they had recaptured the system from the Eroxan slave troops, the humans gave the Driss an ultimatum. Return all systems taken, release all Eroxans they had captured, and give the Eroxans full resource-rich systems as compensation for the terrible crimes committed against them, or else. The Driss were still oblivious to the incoming storm, thinking that they had outmaneuvered their mighty, warlike humans. By the time the humans had recaptured their system and saved the Oroxans they were fighting against, the Driss were deeply entrenched in other systems that they had taken. It would take years to take them back. Or so he thought. So the Driss refused. The humans' response chilled us to the bone. So you want to play dirty games with us? Remember this the short choice. What happens next? is on you. The humans never broke their own laws of war and combat, not in any way that was provable in a court anyway. They provided endless legal documents to prove that they were unable to capture the large numbers of their own military that had gone uh, rogue and were now committing terrible atrocities against the Driss military targets. Napalm, cluster bombs, and sarin became the most feared words in the galaxy. Even when we could prove they had completely collapsed the Driss economy and taken 90% of their financial accounts held in galactic banks, they practically drowned the courts in records, proving that it was all legal. It took 20 years to close all the loopholes, and it was only implied, but unprovable threats from the humans that stopped those loopholes from being exploited by others. The humans never touched a credit of anyone else's money. When at prison transport that just so happened to house their 10,000 most dangerous and violent psychopathic serial killers had managed to be overtaken by the inmates and landed on a Driss planet, no one could prove that it was deliberate. The crimes committed on that planet still haunt the nightmares of anyone who investigated them, and no one could ever prove that the terrorists who had captured and skinned the Driss leaders on a live broadcast of the galaxy weren't actually terrorists with no connection to them, despite how they seemed to have cutting-edge human weaponry and technology. It took the Driss two months to surrender unconditionally. End of story. Story number two. Comply or die. Written by underscore underscore dash underscore 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 dash 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 underscore. The status quo was always maintained. If you didn't rule, you served. Your servitude had no fixed end. It ended as the whims of political intrigue shifted. Everyone wanted to be popular. Everyone wanted to carry a boon of popular support. Everyone knew that it was fate that someone was stuck in servitude. It was simply their turn until political situation said otherwise. That shift was found as soon as another was discovered to fill that subservient role. No one expected fanatics to storm proverbial beaches. The Sunra were the latest to serve. They performed their duties well. You couldn't find a civilized world or hub that lacked Sunra element. They provided their entertainers, sex workers, and labor of the galaxy for the foreseeable future. Their species' survival was guaranteed by their service. No one could deny that, not even after their betrayal. Their betrayal it was, as no one knew what the undead warriors that collapsed governments were until the Sunra were pressed. The living dead served to liberate them from servitude, to deny them the destiny that they were due. The detention facilities where the Sunra were questioned found themselves swarmed by skeletal warriors. It was as if everything the galaxy could offer to counter them would turn to their weakness. That was how the galaxy learned of humanity. A two-front war was considered suicidal. Humanity engaged in an eight-front war, a war that pursued without attempting political contact. There wasn't a star-faring vessel safe from their raiders, 
nor was there a Sonra processor safe from their persecution. Local Sonra leaders found themselves bombarded from orbit if they refused to discontinue personnel transfers. Transporters found themselves subjected to search and interrogation, else they desire outright destruction. There was no halting humanity's persecution of those enforcing the status quo. To do so, guaranteed a division of their orbital drop troops would pay a personal visit. How did you fight a species determined to commit suicide? Within a day of staff discovering an intent to resist humanity, you would see a desertion of security troops. No one wanted to face their skull-faced space specters. There were multiple engagements where their Liberty Battalions were met by mass surrenders instead of resistance. Mass surrenders and direction to whom controlled the economy and status quo. Beings light years away from home, those humans were willing to die for persons not of their species and not of their concern. Their deaths were more problematic than their military hostility or kill ratio. Humanity broadcast everything, especially their last stands. The galaxy shifted as more of their last stands were broadcast. Who could compete on a propaganda scale that supernatural soldiers dying to protect the underclass? Victories against humanity were turned into rallying points, swelling the ranks with humans and non-humans, species they call comrades. The galaxy always knew the term slavery, but the galaxy had learned to fear it when humanity was contacted. Humans would suffer egregious losses to prevent it, and their ranks swell with those liberated. In a decade, they had changed the galactic status quo more than the past millennium had. In three decades, they had shifted the status quo to their standard. Humanity engaged in an eight-front war to outlaw slavery. A war they won and a war they continuously engaged in to protect all sapiens. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed, and if you do, please consider supporting the author, even by popping over and leaving a thumbs up or a nice comment, just to show your appreciation for the story. However, if you wish to support this channel, there are links down below which will help immensely. I will see you all in the next one, and until then, I hope that you have a fantastic day. Cheers.